Hey, what's up? Nasser Malik here. Welcome to performance testing tutorial series. In this series, we'll be learning about performance testing with HP LoadRunner tool. I will be doing similar tutorial series with open source tools also. So let's look at the series highlights, what we'll be covering in these tutorials. So we'll be covering performance test planning and thought process. And this is basically to understand how performance testing is different from functional testing and also look at some of the uh, thought process. Uh, how do you gather information about the system that you're planning to test and some of the SLAs and requirements. Um, so we'll be looking into that. Uh, we'll be using HP LoadRunner and uh, we'll uh, walk through how to install and set up uh, controller and agents and uh, how to configure them. So we will also look at the HP um, LoadRunner um, different applications like ViewGen, which is used for um, recording and um, developing uh, scripts and different protocols. Also look at the controller and how to set up scenarios and uh, do um, analysis. So we'll also look at uh, walk through some of the uh, protocols we'll be using. We'll be using basically web. Uh, and API protocols and just give you basic understanding of those protocols. So there are a lot of protocols that LoadRunner supports. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them. We're just going to take a look at the uh, web application and API portion of the protocols. We will walk through the workload definition and what we mean by uh, workload in industry. So basically workload is a combination of uh, test cases and scenarios that are developed based on the uh, system functionality, the system we're going to test based on the usage and type of transactions that we need to simulate uh, to load test the system. So we'll do, in this series, we'll do an uh, introduction and in how to create script for HTTP um, level protocol, which is lower level, and also clicking script protocol. When HTTP level, you'll be doing correlation and parameterization. Um, so HTTP is a little bit more involved, so we'll take a look at the both. Uh, because majority of time, if you're using, um, if you're testing web application, you'll be using these two protocols. So we'll, um, as I said, uh, we'll be um, doing the introduction to correlation and a parameterization. So basically, parameterization is very simple. Um, you um, replace the hard coded values uh, that you have at recording time and replace them with the parameter, and so you can give it a different value for each iteration or number of users you're running, so they can use a different data. Correlation is basically um, is the system generated data based on your interaction that you need to correlate to make you know, subsequent calls and stuff. So we'll go into it. Uh, there are uh, different ways of doing correlation. So we'll walk through and see you know uh, which one suits you better. You can pick. So it's pretty easy. It's not you know once you get a grasp of it, it's pretty nice. So we'll also uh, look at the scenario setup and execution with basic monitoring. So we'll, we'll take those scripts and we'll create a, a simple scenario, have um, um, you know uh, added uh, basic monitoring like you know transactions uh, and user behavior. We'll go through some of the basic stuff to monitor since uh, I'm not going to have access to like the real system. So we'll try to do as much as possible to help you gain as much as knowledge as possible. So we'll also do the um, go through the analysis tool and um, we'll take a look at it, how to um, uh, read different graphs and different matrix in it and um, how to correlate them and how to look at the, the uh, transaction uh, response time and standard deviation, CPU and memory utilization, sort of that kind of stuff. Also look at the um, and uh, how it, the test ran and how uh, based on number of user, how the transaction response time uh, correlates to number of users. Um, so that kind of like basic information we'll go through. We will also look at the VTS table setup and usage. VTS is basically a virtual table server, which is a utility with part of LoadRunner. And it's very helpful when you're uh, pre-staging data and you have to pre-stage and, and it's like a kind of like a database, it's pretty fast. And, uh, and especially when you're um, running multiple test cases and some of the dependencies on each other. So you can use it to share um, uh, freshly created data across different groups and scripts. So it's very, very powerful. We'll take a look at that. So before we get into some of that uh, stuff, it is very important to understand how uh, the performance testing 
is different from a functional testing. And this will help you a lot uh, because the thought process of doing performance testing is much, much different uh, than functional testing. So this comparison will really help you to plan for performance testing. So we're just gonna uh, take a look at some high level um, st uh, stuff to see you know, what the difference is and give you a better understanding of it. So if we take a look at it in performance testing, uh, basically what you do on performance testing wise, you're not doing functionality testing, you're basically, doing, you're basically validating system behavior under load. On the other hand, with functional testing, you're validating uh, application functionality specifically. You don't really care how the system behaves in, or, uh, in the performance wise or response time, but you, you're trying to validate uh, application functionality based on business requirements. So for performance testing, uh, analysis is pretty uh, complex because you look at the metrics uh, from application server, middleware, database, and you're looking at the CPU utilization, memory usage, disk IO, and a lot of other metrics uh, within the database. And uh, if you're using Java or .NET framework, you would look, you know, look at the, how the garbage collection is happening and the memory usage and all that stuff. But on the, on the other hand, for functional testing, Basically, uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, you have your test cases based on your business requirements. You have adequate coverage uh, and basically run the test case. Either it's a pass or fail. So it's pretty uh, simple. It, it, you don't need a lot of analysis in that sense. On the performance testing side, if you look at it, uh, the requires a adequate system resource. And what do I mean by that? That uh, based on type of load you're gonna run, with, based on number of user, number of transactions, and uh, if you're um, gonna be comparing that to some uh, production system or some SLAs you have. So you have to have a system that will allow you to run that load and to get uh, measurements out of it. But on the other hand, uh, for functional testing, you don't really need a full-fledged system or you need to have a, just a small system functioning enough so you could manually or even with the automation tools, you can walk through and whatever the scenarios you need to run, you can run them. So it's like a um, one user per test case basically kind of scenario, but performance testing, you'll be running many, many users. So the, the, one of the differences between functional testing and performance testing, so performance testing requires you to have a more in-depth knowledge of system that you're going to test because you need to understand um, what are different nodes are, which are the monitoring points you're gonna be like uh, tap into like in the database middleware and how many servers are there, if there's load balancing being happening or um, whatnot. So you will have to look at all that stuff in the architect of the system and figure out um, how you're gonna monitor the system because you're basically looking for any bottlenecks throughout the system. So only way you can um, uh, get that information if you were uh, monitoring it or logging some kind of logs on it. On functional testing, uh, you just need a basic application domain knowledge and functionality. You don't need to really worry about the architect of it as far as the functional testing goes because you're trying to validate uh, uh, business requirements basically. So for the performance testing, tests are load and stress oriented. Um, when I say load and stress, basically, the scenarios are designed based on the specific goal. If it's uh, endurance testing you're trying to do, you're trying to do failover, you're trying to do stress the system uh, uh, to a point to see where the breakage point is. So there are different type of tests you design. We'll, we'll talk about those uh, different type of scenarios that uh, we can create and how do you uh, set them up and uh, run the test. So for the functional testing point of view, tests are basically functionality oriented. Um, so you try to get as many as different uh, happy path and negative testing coverage possible based on the business requirements. So you're not looking at, at the, for functional testing, you're not looking at the system performance or behavior. Of course, I mean, if it's taking, you know, uh, two to five minutes to submit a search or request, I mean, you're gonna have a problem. But overall, I mean, if it's reasonably, um, you know, within the reason, you know, a few seconds to, you know, 10 seconds, five seconds, uh, based on different functionality and functional testing of point of view, this this will be fine. But performance testing is specifically is around the response times and system behavior, how fast we could do search, how many users we could put on and sort of that kind of measurement. 
performance testing required plenty of test data. So because you're going to be running a lot of users and uh, you're going to have multiple iterations, each user running, so you need to have pre-stage data um, that would be used by your scenarios or tests. And also if there is, uh, if you don't have um, flexibility there, so because it takes a lot of time to pre-stage the data. So other um, solution to it, you would pre-stage the data first, and then you would have a data snapshot um, uh, from there on, and then save that snapshot. So every time you run a test, you should restore your uh, database. So it's much, much faster in that way because uh, you don't have to recreate data because uh, most of the time creating test data for performance testing, it takes a lot of time in planning. So it is uh, very uh, helpful if you can um, um, create the data once and take a snapshot and restore it from that point every time. If you are sharing environment with other uh, activities, then you're going to run into some issues because if other activities creating data and they need to re reuse it, um, uh, they will have a problem, so you have to coordinate with them. On the functional testing side, if you compare, uh, the test data is minimal because each test scenario, each test case basically would use one data set. So if, if you're running 50 test cases, it'll use 50 uh, data sets. Uh, but here in performance testing, you know, one, one script may use more than uh, 50 or 100 data sets. So th that, that's a big difference. So performance testing side, the monitoring point of view, system monitoring is required to pinpoint issues. So when I say system, I mean all of the different parts of the system or subsystem that are part of this performance and load testing. Uh, you need insight to those systems. So only way you can get insight is if you have some kind of monitoring on it. So while you're running a test, uh, during the test or after the fact, you could get some kind of data that shows you the performance of the system or any errors and issues. So that's very important. On the functional testing side, system monitoring is not required. Uh, as long as the application is behaving and responding uh, within timely manner and the functionality is uh, um, according to the business requirements, then we're fine. We don't really care about it because it, we're not doing load testing. So performance testing can only be done using automation tools since you have to simulate hundreds and thousands of users. There's no way you can coordinate. I, I do have seen people putting 50 people in one lab and trying to coordinate a manual load test and it was a disaster. So I have seen people doing that, but it's not really um, possible to do a a low test where you could actually do iterative testing and get a uh, reasonable uh, test matrix that you can make sense of. On the other hand, functional testing can be done with and without the automation. So it's not just you are dependent on the automation tool. Even you test it manually or with the automation tool, the results will be the same. So I hope this gives you um, like a bird's eye a view of what the differences are and understand uh, the differences between performance testing and functional testing. And um, that will help you to plan for performance testing. So idea is that you need to understand how they're different from each other and then it gives you a better knowledge of preparing for it. So let's look at uh, uh, test planning and a thought process of how do you go about planning a performance test and what some of the, uh, the tools and information you need to plan for a test. So very first thing you need for performance test planning is to understand the application architect and the testing scope. So if you look at it nowadays, applications, their SOA architect or their, um, you know, their service-based or they're talking to multiple systems like PeopleSoft, Salesforce, or homegrown tools. So you need to understand what the scope of it is, what part of the application you will be testing, what is in scope, what is out of scope, what is the architect, how many <clears throat> application servers, if they're load balanced or not, um, how many databases, uh, sort of that kind of information you need. The next, once you understand the architect, you would need to identify application functionality. What functionality, the functionality that happens within the, that application, and what is the usage, you know, 
um, how the user behavior basically, how they use the application. And be this is important because that'll help you to figure out the workload and how to put a, a load on the system, gradual load or uh, how many number of users you need to ramp up, ramp down, how many active sessions, that kind of information you can get out of this. Also look at the SLAs, what are the SLAs, you know, if there are any agreement with the business, you know, in the searches return in three seconds, five seconds, whatnot. So you have to gather that information to uh, get a better understanding of it. So next, once you get that information, the next uh, step is to figure out the differences between the environment size, between the test environment and production environment. Um, most cases you're gonna see uh, the test environments are much smaller or they're being shared. Um, so you have to do extrapolation, which is much, much harder to do because there's so many variables. So you look at the production, how, uh, what size, uh, like number of CPU, how much memory, how many, how many database servers, how many application server, uh, if the load balancing is similar, or you look at some of the, or you look at some of the database size, you know, if it is, you know, um, 10 million records in production and you have only, you know, 1 million record. And so you look at all that information to uh, do the assessment and figure out what you need, what needs to be done. And we'll talk about it as we plan. So after getting all that information, uh, you will develop a workload based on environment size and usage pattern and all that stuff. So once you get all that information, then you need to figure out uh, number of test cases, type of test cases, uh, based on the user behavior, uh, each group type will be different and then based on that group type, what kind of functionality they'll be executing during the load test, what kind of data they'll be using, how much data you would need for the time period of the test. So you need to figure out the, how long the test will run and how much data will be used by each group and because you need to figure out the number of users for each group or each test case and plus a uh, number of iterations they're going to run and how much data they're required. So you need to have ample data so you don't want to run out of data middle of the test because it'll be an invalid test. So we'll take We'll take a look at some of that, uh, how do we do that. So one thing I wanna do say here, the workload is the most important piece of this. Uh, actually the entire, this the test planning is the most important step in the performance testing. Um, I, I use the analogy as, as, you know, it's almost to think of a machine, you know, you put a good stuff in there, uh, the good stuff come out. You put a garbage in it, the garbage is going to come out. So the better you understand the application architect and the usage and type of users and the SLAs, and you have understanding the environment differences, it will help you to develop an accurate workload that is based on these metrics. And that will help you uh, with the results. So the better the workload mimics the actual usage of the application and scenarios. So more accurate workload will result into more accurate results. So all these things could be happening in parallelly. They don't have to happen in a specific sequence until you um, um, developing your test scenarios and stuff. But for you to do uh, plan a workload, you do need um, in the first three uh, bullets in before you can actually uh, plan a workload, prop accurate workload. Next, we'll identify and stub out out of scope integration points and subsystems. So let me explain. So when you're testing a system or an application, um, there are going to be some integration points. They're integrating different applications. And those applications may not be adequate size to sustain the load we're going to generate for our application. So you need to figure out how to stub them out because that'll be your uh, bottleneck. Because um, if your system is dependent on that subsystem, and that subsystem is not adequate to handle the load. Uh, you won't be able to you won't be able to push the full load through, and that is going to be your bottleneck. So you need to figure out how to stub it out. I also little, uh, spoke a little bit about um, the test data requirements. So when we're developing all this stuff, we have to keep in mind that we'll be doing iterative testing. So performance testing uh, is not just a single shot deal i mean you would have to run multiple tests to uh, pinpoint bottlenecks and stuff next you have to develop an iterative test plan and what do i mean by it is that because in performance testing you won't just need one test 
run for to figure out an issue. You may require multiple uh, performance test executions to figure out uh, an issue because you'll be playing around with the uh, application settings and um, connection pooling and all that stuff. So because you're gonna be running multiple tests, maybe you know multiple tests per day. So if you're uh, pre-staging a data and it takes a long time to pre-stage the data, so workaround would be to pre-stage the data and um, uh, take a database snapshot and then have a restore plan after uh, each test. So each test runs, you restore the database to the same point so you're very quickly ready for the next iteration of tests. So you need to plan for that and figure out how you need to do it. Uh, and there are some caveats with it because if you're sharing the system that it creates a problem, so you need to work through that and have a plan. Next, you need to figure out and create monitoring and reporting strategy. Creating monitoring and reporting strategy um, is basically, uh, if you do have access to the database or middleware, an application server, and you can add the metrics within the load runner itself, so you can put those monitors in. For some reason, if because of the security reasons and all that stuff, you don't have access, so you need to talk to DBA to put uh, monitors in place and um, talk to you know people, application uh, developers, or whoever could help you with to figuring out how to monitor different part of the systems uh, because you will require data to do your analysis. Without it, you'll be running uh, tests in the dark, so you won't really know how the system behaves during the test. In this regards, I mean, you need to make sure that you have adequate um, uh, monitoring on that system. Uh, basically, I think by default, um, uh, LoadRunner does like a three second sampling. You can always change it. Um, the other system, their monitoring system, they may have a different variation of five second or 10 second snapshot. Let's see if you can match it up with LoadRunner. Uh, it is easier when you correlate that to LoadRunner graphs and data. So after said and done, all that information is there. You ran your um, uh, first smoke test and shake out test cycle, and after that, um, you're ready to really do start testing um, the system. The very fir the the first thing you would need to do before you start uh, running all of your uh, test iterations is to get a good baseline, and uh, that is very important because that baseline would serve you. Uh, from from each test iteration every time if you're making changes with configuration applications or database or, or middleware so each each time you make a change if you're tuning it will help you to compare it with the baseline and tell you if it has gotten worse or better so that uh, creating a baseline is the most important thing you would do um, so keep that in mind that uh, every time you have uh, better results for transaction response times and stuff that serves as your new baseline. So your baseline changes as you make improvements. So for each uh, release or sprint, you will always uh, compare your test results with the baseline to make sure, uh, um, look at the transaction response time, CPU utilization, uh, memory usage, disk IO, some of the database monitors and stuff. We'll, we'll talk about these later. But you basically comparing uh, your test results with the baseline and if they're similar, or there is an improvement, you can sign off on your release. And usually this happens after the functional testing is uh, completed. So if the results are similar, then you would keep that baseline. If the results are better on your new test uh, comparing to the baseline, so that that new test becomes your next baseline. And after all of that, if you have time, you can spend some time doing application tuning. For the next tutorial, we'll dive into uh, downloading and installing LoadRunner tool and start creating test cases and apply some of this methodology um, so you can see how um, this information help you to design and develop a performance test from start to end. So thanks for tuning in and thank you very much. Until next time, bye.